The Fermi Paradox, Part 17, A Shadow on the Sun. As fascinating and exotic as these hot Jupiters were, no one considered them likely abodes for life. The infernal temperatures endured in these planets' upper cloud levels meant that they were likely roiling with clouds of gaseous metal and rains of liquid rock. The Doppler shift method favored the discovery of hot Jupiters, since larger planets produced larger wobbles in their stars, and rapid wobbles from rapid orbits were easier to detect than slower ones. If we were to find planets suited for life, we would need a technique that would work regardless of a planet's mass or distance from its star. The most promising candidate was the transit method. The transit method, or more precisely, transit photometry, is remarkably simple. You watch enough stars for a long enough period of time, and, assuming it is facing you side on, a star will eventually dim very slightly as a planet crosses its disk. Transiting planets are treasure troves of information. Through measuring the amount of light blocked by each planet, you can observe how large a planet is. If you've already calculated its mass through the Doppler technique, you can then determine its density and gain a rough understanding of what it is made of. This is how astronomers were able to determine that hot Jupiters were in fact gas giants, and not, as had been previously speculated, giant balls of rock. But perhaps the greatest advantage of the transit method of detection is that it is not restricted to large planets close to their stars. It can find planets even as small and as far from their stars as Earth. In short, If we're ever going to locate a habitable planet, it will likely be by the transit method. There is, however, one massive disadvantage to the transit technique. Transits are extremely rare. In order for a transit to happen, not only does the star have to face a side on, the planet has only a few hours out of its potentially years-long orbit to reveal itself. Transits of Venus, for instance, happen every 120 years or so in pairs six years apart, and only last for about six hours and Venus is a planet close to Earth that we are observing relatively edge-on. The only effective way to search for extrasolar transits is to conduct massive, ultra-sensitive surveys of tens or hundreds of thousands of stars, observed and reobserved over periods of months or years. As an illustration of the magnitude of the effort required, many of the earliest transit surveys are still operational today. The Hungarian Automated Telescope Network, or HATNET, has been going since 2001, and has a total tally of less than 60 confirmed planets. WASP, the Wide Angle Search for Planets, which has been running for almost a decade and collects up to 100 gigabytes of data a night, has found fewer than 120 planets in its lifetime. Clearly these efforts, though valiant, are not enough to find a planet like Earth. What was needed was a survey that would attack the universe with sheer brute force one whose eye would scrutinize so many stars that even a transit as infrequent as Venus would happen every day. And in 2009, we got such a survey, NASA's Kepler mission. With a mirror half the size of Hubble's, Kepler couldn't match it for raw power, but what it did have was an unrivaled location. Unlike Hubble, which orbits the Earth, Kepler orbits the Sun, trailing Earth like a dog from a distance of 950 miles. Free from Earth occasionally blocking its view, its eye was fixed forever on a single field of 145,000 stars, which it watched year in, year out, for four years, only stopping when it blew its stabilizers. Nonetheless, the harvest of data accrued during these four years was staggering. Over a thousand exoplanets, with 3,000 still to be confirmed. More, in fact, than all previous searches combined. For the first time, The framers of the Drake equation had what they had always lacked, a vaguely representative sample of planets covering a wide range of sizes and orbital periods. In 2013, Jeffrey Marcy, the same Jeffrey Marcy who had confirmed the existence of the first extrasolar planet around a sun-like star nearly 20 years prior, searched a sample of 603 Kepler-identified planets and identified 10 that were one to two times the size of the Earth and received between a quarter and four times Earth's solar radiance. From this, he extrapolated that the number of Earth-sized planets in our galaxy that lay within their star's habitable zones was approximately 40 billion. Finally, a solid number, based on actual facts and observation. And the search continues. In January 2015, 
Astronomers at Harvard announced the discovery of Kepler-442b, a planet a third larger than Earth orbiting a red dwarf star with a 97% chance of lying within the habitable zone. While in July 2015, Kepler-452b, a planet 60% larger than Earth, was found orbiting a star very like our Sun at a distance comparable to Earth's. But like most things in the quest to solve the Fermi Paradox, these findings are not as hopeful as they seem. Under the definition Marcy employed, both Venus and Mars would qualify as potentially habitable planets, and Venus in particular is in no rush to be habitable. Some have argued that, as far as the Drake equation is concerned, there isn't any further to go. Even solving the first three parameters doesn't get us any closer, since the last four are completely unknowable. But this isn't necessarily the case. Already, plans are in place to begin cracking the next fraction, the number of planets that develop life. And we will be discussing those plans in the next episode.